going to hand it over to our speaker, Jake Williams. Don't clap yet. You guys have no idea what you're in for. So <laughs> it could be horrible. Let's see. So, uh, <clears throat> oh, that was actually the wrong start slideshow. This is not off to an awesome start. Uh, hold on a second. We'll start from the beginning where we should have started originally. Hey, <clears throat> what's that? Where's your schmoo ball? Yeah, that, that's, hey, they stopped that because people were getting injured, right? The schmoo balls were a, were a horrible, actually, they were awesome. But, but then people started getting injured. So, what's that? Uh, no, they stopped them because people were getting injured is, is the reason they stopped them. Uh, because people got progressively worse and worse schmoo ball or better and better depending on which end of it you were on. Uh, schmoo ball launchers, uh, some of them were gas assisted, uh, which technically uh, the uh, DC police weren't a fan of either. Uh, and so uh, the year that it was ran at, uh, I was over at the Hyatt uh, and they uh, had ShmooCon plus the uh, National Catholic Girls High School Basketball Championship. I was at our hotel, uh, the Overflow Hotel across the street they were in a BDSM conference at, so it was awesome. I mean, it was, it was probably the best schmoo con ever, but it was also the last year for schmoo balls. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, no schmoo balls. Uh, this, uh, this year I'll be doing a Linux privilege escalation. Uh, somebody said, wow, this is out of your depth, uh, or out of your depth, out of your, out of your normal, uh, normal things you do. Uh, don't you normally just do malware? And, uh, and I said, wow, okay, I guess uh, clearly I need to branch out more. Right? Malware and forensics is what I was told uh, that, I, that I did primarily. But I uh, <clears throat> want to do a little bit about Linux privilege escalation. Uh, my company, Rendition InfoSec, uh, does a lot of work in the penetration testing and incident response sphere. You guys can come up here and happily sit up front here. I do not need these monitors. Please don't block the uh, thing. Come on down further because there's people trying to fill in behind you. Happily just sit down here. You can even turn around and watch those monitors, right? Uh, there's monitors right there. It's awesome. Just fill in, right? Uh, so <clears throat> uh, in addition, like I said, we do a lot of that incident response and, and penetration testing. And from a pen testing standpoint, oh my goodness, we see all kinds of problems on Linux servers all day long. And as I started putting this together, I was working with Brandon McCrillis. Uh, he's back there somewhere. Wave, wave your hand around. Yeah, Brandon. And uh, we were kind of gaming this out. Uh, we just flew back in after midnight last night for uh, from another conference that we were doing uh, some uh, network forensic stuff at. We were kind of gamifying out like, hey, how... What do we need to take out of this talk, right? It wasn't a question of what do we put into a talk like this. It was like there's no way this is going to fit in an hour, particularly with demos. And so uh, we think we've got this uh, nailed down here pretty well. Uh, also, we've got some iTunes gift cards as well as the uh, from Rendition, uh, as well as some other uh, other giveaways. So if you tweet uh, tweet at Rendition Sec or at Malware Jake, uh, well, I guess Rendition Sec is what Brandon's going to be looking for. He'll grab the uh, the best three tweets from the talk and uh, iTunes gift cards, right? Plus, we have other stuff from is it Clubhouse? Clubhouse and a land turtle. And I don't know if you guys know about the land turtle, but this is the best thing going because one, they're freaking awesome, and two, they're sold out uh, because Mubix has been doing some really interesting work with them, uh, and they've sold out at Hack Five. I have no idea when they're going to be uh, back from back order, uh, but this is like your one and only chance to get one of these. So I don't know what we're going to do to test for this one, but, but we'll see. Uh, so you don't care who I am. Uh, let's see the agenda. Let's talk about. I mean, you don't, or you wouldn't be here, right? So. Uh, or you just care about the talk. Anyway, purple desolation motivation. Right? What are we doing here? Uh, <clears throat> look, uh, I want to get through, uh, obviously, tearing apart some Linux machines, Unix machines, you name it. We're going to work on Linux today because that's what runs best in my VM, but know that most of these techniques just work. Right? And they're going to work regardless of whether it's Linux or Unix or HPUX or, or IRIX or whatever weird SCO, if you have enough SCO in your environment. Actually, if you have SCO in your environment, just set a fire in the server room. Uh, that's probably about the best way to get rid of it. But, but short of that, uh, <clears throat> realistically, this stuff's still going to work. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, kernel issues, uh, root program issues, stuff that shouldn't be set UID and set GID. And I actually moved this to the end of the presentation. We'll, we'll do some more work there. Talk about trivially vulnerable set UID programs. Look at some cron jobs. Talk about scripts with weak permissions. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of an overview of where we're going. By the way, uh, yesterday, uh, this is another uh, one of my wonderful employees, Brain Children, uh, somebody tweeted out that this was, I think it was B-Sides Augusta tweeted out that this was a uh, James Brown themed event. And I said, what the heck, if this gets 100 re retweets, I'll happily do a James Brown impression, a bad James Brown impression, every time we pop a root shell. 
Uh, most of the demos are towards the end, so stand tight. I'm not going to renege on the promise here. Uh, we'll still be uh, <clears throat> still be doing some bad James Brown impressions. Unfortunately, most of the James Brown stuff that I found, besides singing, which I am not going to do, was James Brown drunk on CNN talking about uh, beating his wife uh, or getting a divorce or something along those lines. So I thought about bringing some props like a lead pipe and a fake gun, and then I thought, no, that's probably not going to work well. Uh, definitely not with ASU and not with B-Sides Augusta. Uh, so <clears throat> let's talk about privilege escalation uh, motivations. You don't have root on the box, but you want it. Uh, <clears throat> did some work with H.B. Gary back in the day. How many folks knew about H.B. Gary? Yeah, how many folks knew about H.B. Gary before they got hacked? Right, exactly. Right, they had Lots of hands go down there. And so H.B. Gary, uh, you probably know, is running a, a Linux server. They called it a support server. Folks that upload files here and do all kinds of wonderful stuff. And, and uh, <clears throat> turns out lots of people shell on the box. And some people, I guess we'll call them anonymous. I don't know that we ever knew who exactly they were. It's kind of in the name there. Uh, they decided they wanted root on the box, and they took it. All right. Uh, of course, that's an obvious motivation. You don't have root, but you want it. Uh, only root users can really effectively hide. Uh, nobody else can really drop a root kit. You can hide in plain sight, sure. You read and write any file, persist between reboots. You want to bind a low-numbered port. All right. So like a TCP port 80, for instance, uh, is a low number below 1024 port. You've got to have root probes to do it. Some privilege escalation notes. Uh, I don't use binary exploits. Uh, we do a lot of pen testing. I don't want to say I don't use binary exploits. But man, do we ever work to not do that. Uh, it's, uh, Ed Scotus has a great pen testers pledge. Uh, effectively goes something like, never use an exploit when you can use PS exec. Right? And I'm kind of in the same mode here with, uh, with, with Linux. I, I'm not going to use an exploit if something way more graceful works. And the reality is, in 9 out of 10 of our last pen tests at Rendition, something else has worked really, really well. Uh, we've only had to resort to binary exploits in, in, in one or two cases uh, over the last couple of years. Because the reality here is every time you run a binary exploit, you are risking a crash. There, there's no two ways about it. And, and as a consultant, I really try not to crash my clients' machines, right? Even processes on their machines. Nobody likes that. Uh, it turns out even when you say, but you signed off on the scope of work, nobody's cool with it still. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Don't do it, right? Uh, so we want to do that as a very, very last resort. Uh, some purple escalation is a waiting game. This is another good note because sometimes maybe I get to write a file to the cron D directory. Uh, that's unfortunate. Well, it's unfortunate that you let me write something to the cron D directory. Uh, when is that going to run? Well, next time cron runs, right? Or in some cases when cron D restarts uh, to reread that directory, depending on your system configuration. Uh, as you know, Linux systems and Unix systems sometimes stay up for a long, long time. So this may be a, a long waiting game, but if you're a if you're a nation state, uh, you know, for instance, I don't know, China, uh, or I don't know, maybe some other nation state we could think about that might be in the room here. Uh, but if you're a nation state and you're willing to wait that kind of time, then uh, and you got the long game, uh, hey, you know, we'll take advantage of this. Now, again, if there's a binary exploit to come back behind us, I'm not going to wait a year uh, to gain root on a box. But if that's all I can do, then, then okay, we'll work with that, right? Uh, we have to wait for Cron D to restart. Maybe I overwrite a restart script. Same thing going on there. So what about kernel issues? This is a Captain Obvious kind of moment here. Uh, I love kernel issues as much as the next guy. VM splice, uh, certainly VM splice exploits are cool. Ptrace exploits are really cool. Uh, we see a lot of Ptrace uh, floating around over different Linux versions. I don't understand what it is about Ptrace, but apparently it is way hard to get right. Uh, Ptrace, if you're not familiar, uh, you should definitely take this home and go look at Ptrace. Uh, Ptrace is a Linux debugger. And effectively, Ptrace allows you to debug programs. Now, we're going to talk about in a minute, set UID programs run as the user that owns the file. Now, if you're running a debugger, which means you're in God mode, allowing you to run a set UID binary in the debugger where you're in God mode, where the binary runs as root, would be a tremendously stupid idea. And the Linux developers, despite uh, having a huge affinity for penguins, are not idiots, right? And despite having their own servers hacked, you know, still not idiots, right? And so they've actually looked at this and they've said, okay, cool, anytime we run a set UID binary in Ptrace, we're not actually going to run it as root. Well, it turns out that the way that they end up having to do that is it runs as root for just a split second before it drops permissions. I say split second, like a split nanosecond. And if you're a computer science student or a student of the game here, uh, you well know then that that's a race condition. Right? And there have been a lot of times where uh, Linux has screwed that up. And there are lots of ptrace vulnerabilities uh, that involve uh, that involve different race conditions in different scenarios. Uh, where and, and turns out a lot of our Linux uh, kernel exploits 
actually do rely on those race conditions as well. So one of the first things I'm going to do when I'm looking at a Linux system, uh, Brandon talking uh, later today about some of the voice over IP systems uh, that we run into, uh, lots of Internet of Things. I think his talk is named the Internet of Terrible, uh, basically redefining IoT. I absolutely love that. Uh, but the, uh, a lot of the IoT devices run Linux under the hood. Uh, we keep seeing the, uh, I was at Lowe's a couple of days ago and saw a fridge, a fridge running Linux. Tell me why your fridge needs to run Linux. I have no idea. As it turns out, though, I kid you not, in my fridge at home, I have something called Eggminder. If you haven't seen an Eggminder, Amazon that thing because it's freaking awesome. Uh, it actually is a, an IoT device uh, that holds eggs and tells you over a smartphone app, by the way, again, running Linux, uh, over a smartphone app, over your Wi-Fi, how low you are on eggs. So while you're at the store, you can go look and see how many eggs. You have. It even tells you which egg you need to use next and when your eggs are going bad because nothing sucks like making a four-egg omelet breaking the first three into the pan and then find out that fourth one is not okay. Right? You've just wasted the other three eggs. I'd have rather a three egg omelet than a no egg omelet, which is actually pretty nasty. Anyway, so uh, again, uh, looking at all the stuff running Linux, we want to know what version is it running. If it's an IoT device, odds are good. God help us, odds are good. It's probably Linux 2.6. Maybe, uh, yeah, usually 2.6. Uh, for whatever reason, I guess it's the long development times. Uh, most of the exploit mitigations aren't in place. But we're going to look for the full kernel version with uname minus a. We're also going to look at Etsy release and Etsy issue. Now there's an Etsy issue and Etsy issue.net. It depends on uh, your actual distro of Linux, which one you're going to have. But this is going to tell you, is it Ubuntu, is it Red Hat? Sometimes these particular uh, distributions make some configuration error that we can capitalize on. Again, I don't like to work harder than I have to. Uh, if there's a, I'm, everybody that's ever worked with me knows I am extremely lazy and I am not going to work any harder than I have to to get the job done. Uh, if there's some misconfiguration here that we can take advantage of, that's where we're going first, right? Uh, so let me Google that for you, and we'll go look for known issues uh, with those kernels as well as the releases. Now, if I find a binary exploit in the kernel, are we going to go hit that? No, we're going to catalog that away as a last resort. Uh, hitting it now is, uh, seems like a bad thing. So, so let's not do that. Uh, so again, just because you find a kernel export doesn't mean you should use it. I talked about that it might not be stable. Uh, it may, may cause an actual immediate crash. Uh, I would teach the uh, 504 course for SANS. There's some privilege escalation stuff in there. Uh, we'll say, hey, if you're in the back trying to find a seat, you can scootle down to the front and make your way around the, the other stairs there and sit on stairs. Everybody's happy there. You know, all tight and, and awesome together. Anyway, so it might not be stable. You might get an immediate crash. You might get rid of the crash the box. And when we run the 504 course, that's what, pre that's what happens all the time. Uh, folks find a privilege escalation and they're like, bam, right? And, and they exploit the machine and bam, it falls over. And, and they're like, but I got root. And they're like, cool, but did you do anything? And they're like, no. Right? Did you alert the, uh, did you alert the incident responders? So they're like, no. And I'm like, yes, think again, right? We totally alerted the incident responders because you crashed the box and nothing says, nothing says, hey, call the incident responders like uh, not having the machine available. Okay, so uh, the exploit might have undesirable artifacts that get you caught. Uh, VM Splice is a great example of this. This was an awesome uh, this virtual memory splice. This actually has to do with being able to overwrite kernel memory from user space, which, as you might imagine, is a really, really bad feature as it were for a uh, Linux operating system to have. Uh, you can then take UID zero privileges, which is which is rude. Uh, now this one works pretty reliably. But it also generates a bunch of garbage in syslog. And it is really obvious garbage in syslog. And it's, it's one of those that after you've seen it once or twice, you're like, hey, Ray Charles can see what's going on here. Some attack <laughs> just bounce the box with VM splice. Right? Uh, so look, the privilege of uh, privilege escalation, it, it's really following modified versions of Occam's razor. Right? Uh, we all know Occam's razor. This is uh, basically the simplest explanation is usually true. We kind of roll back and say, hey, let's go with the simplest exploit first. Uh, because or simple technique first, as it turns out, because uh, simpler is always better. Uh, root program issues. Uh, so if you're running services as root, stop. Right? Uh, you would think, I checked my watch this morning, it turns out it's 2016. I haven't fallen into a wormhole or something. It is it's 2016, and yet we continue to see services running as root. Uh, last year, a rendition was doing some work with a, a large medical company and a large medical organization and found out their ID pumps we're running a web server as root. You shouldn't run a web server as root, ever. As a matter of fact, don't run any services as root. Servers, generally network available servers. But running a web server as root, particularly when you have unauthenticated CGI, is a really phenomenally bad idea, right? 
Uh, and then I thought, it can't get any worse than this, until, wait for it, we found the defibrillator <laughs> with the web server running as root. And riddle me this, Batman, why does the defibrillator need a web interface? <laughs> and if you run over to a hospital over here, they can actually explain it to you, because somebody in, in medicine explained it to me very quickly. Right? Duh, it's obvious that we need remote monitoring capabilities to alleviate the number of ACLS certified nurses. And I'm like, I don't understand a thing you said, just like you don't understand what I meant when I said this thing shouldn't have a web interface. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it comes down to saving you money, which uh, is what we're all about with Obamacare and stuff. Hey, look, bottom line, uh, they're trying to get back, uh, ultimately kind of scale back uh, the number of uh, nurses that they need available on the floor. Uh, but they've got some crazy stuff. And this isn't just, I mean, it's your fridge, it's your uh, it's my egg minder, right? It's, it's you name it, it's everything out there. We've got way too many services still running as group. Now I'm not talking about your, okay, wait. I hope I'm not talking about your production Linux and Unix servers, right? If you've got something that was built in the last decade, hopefully uh, you're not still running stuff as group, and yet you still see it. Uh, particularly your IoT devices, uh, these other Linux kernel devices that you put onto your network and can run. I'm gonna leave a couple of vendors out of this, but we're working uh, an instant response right now that involves a backup vendor. And this one, this one's freaking scary. All of your backups uh, are going on to a device that has a DNC server running as root that you, the user, cannot disable. And it's DNC, and that's my first problem, is it's DNC. And it's DNC, right? But it's running as root, and so now I'm super annoyed. Anyway, and so this is something that people are paying a lot of money, like six-figure uh, backup solution uh, for your, and it's supposed to be point-and-click and awesome, and and all kinds of awesome stuff. But again, you can't use the user turn that off. And again, the daemon's running as root. Uh, horrible, horrible idea. Uh, look, uh, we can do a binary exploit of a root, uh, root on the program. This is way better than a kernel exploit. If I fail, I'm not going to crash the machine. In most cases, the service falls over and it restarts. This is an ideal place for me to be because hopefully nobody notices that that service just fell over. And if I get on the box eventually, right, then uh, <clears throat> if I get on the box eventually, uh, I can go ahead then and hopefully clean up my logs. This is a great time to tell you that you should absolutely configure external logging. We recommend that you have a SEM in place uh, all the time. You put a security event information management system in place. If you really want to make an attacker poop his pants, right? Make sure that you do external logging because that makes the attacker think very, 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 very hard about what they're going to do next. Right? So binary exploits again, much, much better here for root on a program than uh, going after the kernel. What about bad path configuration? Don't put dot in your path. That's your current working, uh, current working directory. We see this all the time. It's, it's mind-blowing. Uh, it's like shooting yourself in the foot repeatedly. Uh, there's a crazy number of ways that this can go wrong. Uh, sometimes your system is looking for a command that may not be somewhere in the path. Uh, if you have to do this, uh, one, don't do it for root. Right? That, that's, that's number one. And two, put dot at the end of the path so that it only is accessed if the command isn't found anywhere else. In general, just don't do it. And when you find it, beat somebody about the head with some large, blunt object. Right, whoever set that stuff in place, uh, because 10 times out of 10, we're going to exploit that. What are truly vulnerable set UID programs? Ltrace is the cat's meow for finding problems here. Right? So we love Ltrace. Uh, we're going to run Ltrace against any set UID and set GID programs that we find. There are a ridiculous number of these that are homegrown and use the system syscall. A lot of our systems administrators have figured out that they cannot set scripts to be set UID. And they have a help desk function. I actually used to be help desk, uh, help desk, a little bit help desk, and then shortly afterwards I was a systems administrator, and I did not, because I knew some of the people on the help desk, want to give them root access to my systems. And very quickly though, I figured out that they needed some access to files that only root had. And I figured sudo would be the way to do this, right? So I'm like, cool, I'll give them sudo access, but not overall sudo access. And I found out, man, there's a crazy number of problems with that that we're going to cover on the back end here. And so I'm like, cool, I'll just write a script and I'll set it to be set UID. And it turns out that Linux, smartly, does not allow scripts to be set UID. They're kind of step back and they're like, whoa, that's a bad idea. Let's not do that. And go ahead and Google that problem. And the first eight results that come up, somewhere down at the bottom of the page, there's one on Stack Overflow, and I checked this morning, it's like, don't effing do that, right? But, but the top eight results, are, hey, here's how to write a trivial C program, which can be set UID, that calls your script, right? And so the idea here is rather than your script being set UID, the C program that's set UID and runs as root calls your script as 
Root, right? And this completely bypasses the Linux protection model. And look, I don't blame the Linux and Unix developers here. There's no way to fix this, right? I mean, they put enough safeguards in place. This is like you driving that rental car, you take that Bowie knife out, and you just punch it in the airbag before you start going, take the seatbelt off, and drive into a telephone pole, right? <laughs> All the protections were there to save you, right? You're so good at punching right? So, hey, awesomeness, right? Uh, what about cron job? Oh, by the way, here. Great, uh, great screenshot if you're looking for one here. Uh, go find, uh, notice the output file here, right? Uh, Tamp gating security hole, right? Uh, we're looking for our set UID program. So if there are legitimate set UID programs, ping, for instance, is a set UID program. It needs raw sockets. Uh, you as a regular user cannot break raw sockets. That's a good thing. But ping has to be able to, right? Uh, what about passport? We have to be able to update Etsy Shadow. Uh, we don't want regular users doing that, but but in general, the problems of running with set UID are all the other crap that systems administrators put on the system. Some of these third-party uh, installations, I'm not going to get sued, so I'm not going to mention any names like Oracle uh, or Sybase or <laughs> any of the other <laughs> uh, third-party software that may or may not install vulnerable set UID configurations. None of them do. My lawyer told me not to say any of those. Okay, so anyway, cron jobs, right? So you can read cron files. Or can you read cron files owned by other users? In some distributions, the answer is yes. Right out of the box, you can read all the cron jobs. Uh, this doesn't mean that I can do anything immediately, but it does mean that I can read all the cron jobs. This gives me a hint for where to go next. Right? Can, I, can I then go and look at any of the directories there to see, can I write to any of those directories? Can I overwrite, if for instance a cron job calls a script, is that user writable? It may not be world writable, but is it group writable? for a group that I am in? And if the answer is yes, we win, right? Because the next time that cron job fires, it's going to run commands of my choosing, right? So can I write to the cron D directory? In that case, I have to wait for cron to restart, possibly to reboot, or the next time one of the system admins changes the cron jobs. There's a lot of opportunities here that we have, uh, <coughs> that we have available. What about weak permissions on scripts? In general, I'm looking around for scripts that I think are going to be called by root. One of the first places that I go here in later versions of uh, later versions of Linux, I start dumping the system D configuration. Now we all know system D was created by the devil. Uh, so for older versions of Linux, we go and look at the SE and D uh, directory, and start looking at the scripts that are available there. When we find the scripts there, we start looking through and see where do the <clears throat> where do the folks that wrote these scripts not specify the full path for the executables that they're calling. For instance, as opposed to, let's say, for instance, the command you want to run is cat. Do, do they call cat or do they call slash bin slash cat? Are we fully, fully, fully qualifying the path or are we just guessing here, right? Uh, if we're guessing, that's a potential place where we can gain some, uh, let's say, manipulate the environment, right? We can't always do this, but sometimes we can. And, and so then, in that case, possibly a different cat than the one uh, that the script author intended uh, could potentially be called. We don't want to just check the scripts called by privileged users. Many of these call other scripts. Uh, now, one thing that you've got to know on Linux is that in many cases, in Unix, in many cases our scripts don't end with a .sh. Right? So by convention, we would expect them to end with a .sh. There's no requirement that they do. And so a lot of times you'll find an executable, you'll see it being called from some, uh, <coughs> from some configuration script. You go take a look in there and you realize this thing is itself actually a script, right? Either cat it out, uh, more or less, we'll talk about those in a little bit, uh, or maybe just run the file command against it and see is it actually an ELF binary or a dwarf binary, uh, depending on your platform, or is it actually a script? In which case, excuse me, is it actually a script? In which case, uh, are there possibilities we can write to that? Or what other dependencies does it have? We're going to recursively walk through these dependencies. We're looking for something that we can impact change on from our current position. Weak permissions on binaries, and this, this one almost goes without saying. Uh, look, in most Linux environments, you're not going to be able to write uh, directly write binaries. Uh, too bad, so sad. Again, these third-party installs and stuff that system admins put together, oh my goodness, uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, we recently found one where, found a system where user local bin uh, had been reset to where it was world writable. And we like that. Now, not all the files inside user local bin were world writable, but the actual directory itself was world writable. Uh, this is on the Ubuntu system, so we know for a fact that it didn't come from the factory like that. Uh, this is a place where a system admin had screwed up, not realized what they had done, and uh, failed to unscrew the permissions. Uh, we capitalized on that, of course, because 
why would you, right? Uh, so it turns out the user local bin was in the path ahead of some other stuff that it shouldn't have been. Uh, I know, darn, right? And so by just adding some files there, again, the next time uh, root ran a number of commands, uh, they ran our commands instead of the commands that they intended to run, uh, giving a shell on the box. Right? So we're happy about that. Again, we're unlikely to find world writable binaries that we can just overwrite. It's much more common to find directories with bad permissions than the actual uh, the actual files themselves. We'll quickly talk about weak permissions on LD preload. If you're not familiar with LD preload, this is another Google it. I don't have time to walk through all of the intricacies of LD preload. It's like looking at a VCR manual to figure out when you can use this and when you can't. Uh, but it is something worth putting into your bag of tricks. Effectively, the idea with LD preload, if you were here for last year's B-Sides Augusta, I gave a talk on exploiting Windows systems uh, using DLL sideloading. And so effectively DLL uh, path hijacking is uh, what we covered the most of. Uh, but with this effectively, what you're doing is you're trying to load a regular program loads, but it loads malicious libraries instead of the ones the system intends. Very, very common on uh, Windows, as it turns out, uh, reasonably common on Linux as well. Uh, with LD preload, what we're looking to do here is set this environment variable and we say, here are where to find copies of libraries we would like you to preload into memory in case you need a special version of a library different from the ones that are normally on the system. And this can give us tremendous, uh, <clears throat> give us tremendous access here because as this, uh, as this binary that's possibly running with elevated privileges uh, runs, it's actually loading our version of our library, which of course is then executing code. Uh, this means we win uh, and we gain root permissions. The bad news here, well, I'll take it back. Let's talk from the defender standpoint. Most of us are defenders, not pen testers. Actually, what's, what's, the, what's the split here? How many folks are pen tests slash attack folks? How many folks are defenders? How many people won't raise your hand for anything? <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, so there we go. Okay, so, so I'm going to go from the defense standpoint, right? Because I think that's the majority of the room here, minus all the cloak and dagger folks who wouldn't raise their hand for anything. Uh, but uh, the LD preload, uh, look, from a defense standpoint, this is awesome. Uh, Linux uh, developers looked and they said, hey, there's a set UID program, it's going to run with root permissions. And we probably shouldn't let that happen, right? Because as uh, you can imagine, that, that, would be, uh, that would be really, really bad. Uh, so, is it, hey, if it's going to run as root, uh, or run with root permission because of set UID, don't honor the LD preload uh, variable at all. And a lot of folks step back and they say, cool, you can't gain root permissions with LD preload. And that's not what I said at all. What I said was, you can't use this with set UID programs. But oftentimes, you can manipulate the environment that some of these startup scripts are called in. And that's because they're poorly written. You can manipulate the environment, in which case you can preload into commands that are running as root, just not necessarily set UID binaries. Now, doing this sometimes is like look like a root Goldberg machine, right? So, so I don't have time to run through all the intricacies up here. We are going to go pop some shells in a minute because that's more fun than me talking. Plus, I'm starting to lose my voice here. That's no fun for anybody. Uh, so, but again, keep this in your bag of tricks. Go research this. This is a great blast when all else fails. Uh, sometimes, i got to be honest, I've had some spots where I'm kind of like, we could probably keep chasing this down, but I am going to go to run a binary exploit, right? So, so just to know how difficult this is, or sometimes, this may be a case where we popped a binary kernel exploit before, uh, before I spend too much more time. What about uh, set UID and set GID? Amazing number of system admins do not understand what should be set UID and set GID. Uh, any command is sudo. This is really cool, too. A lot of folks don't have sudo permissions to go to go sue, uh, but they have sudo permissions to go do other things. This is where we get the majority of, I'd say about 80% of our privilege escalation comes from here. Uh, because we find that system admins, particularly folks when we were able to compromise a help desk account or a uh, administrative, you name it, whether it's the accounting department or the whatever, there's that one guy that knows Linux, right, he's going to help out. Right? So what will end up happening is the system admins will come in and they'll They'll set up some sudo, limited sudo permissions for, for this person so that they can tail a file or just do some general awesomeness. And, and it turns out that this can have horrible, horrible impacts, right? Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of these here. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, any command in sudo uh, that can edit or overwrite files is an obvious risk. If I can overwrite files as root, I can overwrite Etsy shadow, which means I can overwrite root's password, or I can be really crappy, and I can just overwrite my UID and make it zero. And that means that Linux will check my password and say, yep, you're good to go. And they'll sign my account UID to zero, which means I'm root. Right? So I don't have to sudo again. I'm basically just root at that point. 
So we don't want to allow our attackers to overwrite files at any point. If we allow our attackers to overwrite files, let's see our attackers. If we allow our users to overwrite files at any point, uh, in that case, our users effectively can gain root permissions at will. Uh, users restricted sudo access, uh, of course, again, with these writing file options, can uh, use those to gain unrestricted root permissions. We see tons of obscure editors with a set UID bit set. I have seen nano done with set UID, which is mind blowing. Pico. Uh, this is really, really stupid. Don't, don't do this, right? Uh, if you have an editor with set UID permissions set, that means that attackers slash users uh, can just go run the editor and they automatically gain root privileges. We've also seen attackers leave this as a backdoor, right? So we've seen attackers that have changed the permissions on, uh, changed the permissions on Pico or some other editor that's not used very often by anybody. Uh, and basically what we'll do then is set that as set UID. And then if you boot them off the box at some point and they're back on limited permissions or with limited permissions, they just uh, nano or pico uh, <coughs> Etsy shadow and they're back to root, right? Or, or any other file that they want for that matter, they're in God mode. Right? So this is something to look for from an incident response standpoint. Uh, it's also something to look for from a uh, general security standpoint. We want to make sure this didn't happen. Uh, and in one security assessment that we did, we said, hey, uh, wow, this, this is really dumb. You shouldn't do this. And the admin's like, we didn't. We're like, Danger Will Robinson, right? So it's kind of one of those, uh, you guys remember Lost in Space where that guy walks around, Danger, Danger Will Robinson, right? He's got the driver vents for arm, the driver vent hoses for arms, and the, what a horrible robot. Anyway, uh, look, we sincerely hope no system admins are stupid enough to have uh, set UID permissions on editors, but we know better. We've seen it a couple of times uh, for folks that really were, and traditionally what happens here is these are Windows admins who have inherited a couple of Linux machines. Normally these are, they start out as appliances, they lose support for the appliances because whoever produced it originally got bought out by Google or, or some other company that I, you guys are on your own, right? And so one of the last patches that manufacturer puts out is the, you now have unrestricted shell access, go for it, because you are truly on your own, right? Uh, so a lot of Windows admins pick these up and they're like, hey, I got it figured out. Here's how to get around this problem I was having. And unfortunately, you can Google just about anything. And we've tried this before. We're like, where did you come up with this? They're like, we Googled it. And this was the suggestion. We're like, there is no way that's the top. Oh, oh that is the top suggestion. <laughs> that's the top first page of suggestion. And it's, it's really bad. Don't, don't trust me. Right? I mean, in fact, I'm always thinking about like writing a bad system admin advice, right? And like, yes, cash poisoning some of my targets. And so basically, like, they go and they're like, how do I secure my Cisco router? And I'm like, winner, right? And provide them with really bad, I don't know, well, that would be a longer game to play, but, but hey, maybe one day, right? Uh, so look, don't, don't, don't sue the eye or any other editor, right? Uh, look, this is so dumb, it's Ubit. Does anybody know what Ubit means? Ubit's so stupid we had to drop the ST, right? I can't even charge the full number of letters for this. Just don't do it, right? Uh, any editor, for that matter, but DI in particular. And let, let me show you why this is, is really, really a bad idea. Uh, so I've got a terminal up here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my user, Jake. Uh, we're going to go ahead and... We're going to go ahead and make it bigger first. That seems like a good plan to, uh, a good plan to go with. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, can everybody read that in the back? Good to go? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so I've got my, uh, got my uh, Jake account here. I'm going to go to sudo minus L because I want to see what Jake can actually do. Let's assume for a minute that Jake had a horrible password, like password. By the way, if you were following me on Twitter earlier this week, uh, you probably saw that we actually did set up a server with the uh, admin and password as the username and password. and let people to face it. We were uh, going for some, actually got some really interesting, uh, really interesting stuff there. Uh, anything out on the internet. The cool part was some of the most interesting hits that we got didn't have a refer from Twitter, right? So which seems to indicate that they were found on, you know, just scanning the internet type thing rather than, uh, we went to Mike Banks' talk earlier today. Uh, you know that, uh, well, lots of people do lots of crazy stuff in honeypot type scenarios. Uh, we got a lot of interesting, uh, interesting data there. So let's assume that this guy has a really bad, uh, a uh, really bad password, <coughs> dude. Fire that guy. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got the bin cat and bin echo and bin ls. Bin cat feels like you should be able to cat a file out as root and redirect the output of that. And it turns out Linux isn't that stupid, right? There are a couple of older legacy Unix systems that are that stupid. Linux is not, right? So when you do that greater than sign to overwrite an output file, uh, Linux every recent version of Linux anyway, 
uh, even the two six variants of, of Linux, <coughs> they will end up doing a subshell for that, and that subshell does not run with set UID permissions. So good news, right? There are the pseudo permissions. So good news there. Uh, we can't use cat to effectively just destroy the box. Same thing for echo. Uh, LS, uh, we've seen this one, but there's not a whole lot to be figured out to do with LS. Uh, we talked about VI though a minute ago. Now look, I know that I can just VI any file that I want. As a matter of fact, let's try this. I'll try to do VI Etsy shadow. It says permission denied, uh, but if I sudo VI Etsy shadow, what? Take a picture. Oh, you're not. My hash is, is trivial. It is password. So, so go for it. I'll save you. It is password. Exactly what type of that is. my VM here. You're not going to hack it, right? Uh, so, clear from TAO, Mike, but you're not going to. So, uh, anyway, uh, I can do a colon here. Uh, in this case, uh, you're probably familiar with VI, or you may not be familiar with VI, whatever. Look, I, I could change the password hash to a known password and, and do something awesome here. This is already known as password. That's not the cool part. What's cool is when you type shell, because you can run shell commands from the VI. Don't ask me why, but, but somebody thought that was a great idea, and you can. And the problem here is that that's a privilege escalation. The point that we type shell, now we're root. If you're familiar with the little uh, symbols here, it's not root, and pound sign means you are root, right? And that's, that's a bad day if you're in some responder slash. We'll just call this a resume updating event, right? So, uh, okay, so don't do VI, right? Uh, don't do VI. At that point, you've got a full root shell. Uh, we want to go ahead and, and, and not uh, not fail miserably. That, that's that's kind of one of my goals in life. Uh, I don't always uh, I don't always win, but, but most of the time we try not to fail miserably. So so don't do VI. Oh, I said I was going to change the round. I feel good. <laughs> so, I can't do many of those anyway. So uh, less, right? Uh, less certainly is the safe then. Uh, VI is dumb, but but less is probably okay. Uh, not so much as it turns out. Less is actually an editor. Most people don't think of less as an editor. Less is actually an editor. This is something that a lot of system admins do not know. We're like, hey, why did you why did you sue to an editor? And they're like, less is an editor. We're like, whoa, 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 less is definitely an editor. Now, if you're on your Ubuntu system, you're probably safe just by the fact you're on your Ubuntu system. Modern Ubuntu uses Nano as the default editor. And so if you haven't changed the default editor to VPI, <coughs> probably safe here because Nano doesn't allow you to run subshell commands. But if it happens to be that your, excuse me, that your uh, less, uh, or sorry, your default editor is VI, or you're on pretty much any other Linux distribution, right, where the default editor is Vim, uh, less it turns out is a is also a huge uh, huge vulnerability. So we'll go to sudo less. Let's do a sudo, not a sudo, sudo less uh, as shadow. No James Brown impression this time because I'm I'm gonna burn on time here, right? Uh, but so. So what are we going to do here? Well, it turns out when I press the V key, it drops into an editor, which happens to be the I in this case, and then we shell, and again, we're back to root, right? Okay, so this is bad, right? So don't do this either. <laughs> this is another great way to pop a root shell. You allow somebody to less the file, and the reason you do this, as it turns out, uh, in most cases, is because you've got a some file that's owned by root, but the help desk or some other user needs to be able to see this. We see this like in the accounting department where they have to be able to run back through the logs or something. Again, this is all kinds of bad for you. But let's let's try to avoid uh, let's try to avoid this. And again, the reason I'm doing this here is that most people don't don't really understand the uh, I don't really understand the trade space and, and the threat space here uh, for the, uh, the landscape of vulnerability. Okay, so less I'm not going to jump back in the slides here uh, too much. Just take it bigger. Not that. Not that big. <laughs> Let's try to avoid the uh, jumping in and out of the area. Okay, so uh, don't sue do more. More is just as dumb, right? So I've had folks who are like, well, less is an editor, but more doesn't contain an editor. And it's like, you're right about that. More does something even stupider. Uh, so sudo more as a shadow. And look, the fact that I'm doing as a shadow doesn't matter. If we're sudo, we can do whatever we want, and we're still going to gain uh, root permissions. This can be a file you create. It can be any file. It can be a binary file, for all I care. It ultimately doesn't matter what the name of the file is, right? Uh, okay, it has to be long enough for the page ends. Let's do this. Uh, let's do bar log. System. Okay, it has to be long enough if you actually get a page. I said any file. That was a lock, obviously, right? But something that at least creates a full page of output, or I could just scroll my screen down uh, to where it was only four or five lines big, and that would cause the page as well, right? So, uh, anyway, here I'm going to go ahead and type the exclamation mark, the bang, oh, excuse me, the question. When I do a question mark, if you look up there, 
Notice the bang command, right? And so more will not being an editor will allow you to run an editor if you choose to. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just run, uh, let's do bash. And so now we're back to it, right? And so this again, also a horrible idea. And we see this all the time. Look, uh, if you take nothing else away from the stock, you should go take a look at your pseudoverse file because you're going to find some stuff. I'll bet somebody in this room uh, who's doing some stuff on Linux and probably on, probably built into some of the appliances that you pay great money for uh, are some of these things built into pseudo commands, right? You don't want this. Well, I want this. You don't want this, right? Because my kid, uh, she walked out here. My, my kid needs to go to college, right? And, and ultimately, uh, in order for her to do that, I have to do lots of great instant response. In order for you to do that, you have to get hacked. And so I strongly encourage you to take nothing away from this talk and not go check yourself <laughs> uh, because, uh, again, my kid needs to go to college. Okay, so what else can we do uh, that's, that's horrible? Well, we're living in America, right? Another James Brown impression? No? No? Okay, well, anyway, so I can't beat the. Well, anyway, so. Okay, so uh, when we think of a good reason, we can't think of a good reason for copy or move uh, to be in sudo anywhere at all, period, right? Uh, there, there's no reason for this, uh, no reason for this, but, but it turns out that it is all the time. Uh, if you find this in your sudoers file, get rid of it, burn it with fire, something, right? Because if you can copy or move a file, uh, you can overwrite any file on the system. First off, your attackers can copy Etsy Shadow to something else that they can then read. Uh, that's obviously not, not, a, not an awesome move there. Uh, also, your attackers slash admins, uh, by the way, if they can copy or move, uh, there are some really interesting ways that they can destroy the disk uh, and actually do some destructive impact as well. Right? So, so that's a really interesting one there. Uh, you know, again, uh, my kids' hot college fund needs a boost, uh, but in general, uh, that one can be at your, uh, your expense. Right? Fine, we see this one regularly. And, and the purpose, the stated purpose that we hear is that our system admins want our help desk to be able to go purge files. So we have a web server and a web server, our vulnerable web servers, it turned out. Uh, some folks came in and created some really large files that used up all the disk space. And so one of the things that my help desk might do is they might run find uh, with sudo permissions to go find files larger than one gigabyte in the var www folder, right, or var www temp or var temp, whatever, and then exec or remove command against those. Turns out that once you give, once you give the, uh, the user slash attacker sudo permissions to find, they can do whatever they want. Uh, let's do a sudo, and the way find is supposed to work, right? I could say sudo find uh, root, and let's do root Etsy, right? So Etsy, and we would find all the files there, right? I could even do an exec. Uh, ls minus l, and this little brace here with the uh, trailing uh, semicolon says go ls minus l. We'll just do an ld here just in case. And so we can go through and get uh, long directory listings and all that. So we can exact commands against those files. Or we just get a root problem. So either way, right, that's up to you. Uh, you can do whichever you prefer. Right? Just remember, find is running this root. Find can exact other commands on behalf of find. Uh, it turns out here that the find is, is executing bash. It turns out it's actually doing a perfect file that it finds, but that's not important because bash does some special system call uh, that ultimately means you only get one copy of bash. So we only have to exit once. That, that's nice. Okay, I said that, we only have to exit. Ah! Okay, so I fail on this one. Oh, I remember we did differently last time. Okay, look, we're going to have to get a new, uh, new prompt here. That's not <laughs> Well, the demo gods are not with me today, all right? So, and that was password in case I didn't care. Okay, so, uh, okay, so don't sudo script interpreters. This is also stupid, and, and this is another mind-blowing piece. We see it all the time. Uh, I die a little bit inside every time I see a script interpreter set for sudo permissions. Uh, regularly, again, system admin installs. We have this awesome Python script that goes and cleans up files and does all this awesome stuff, and and it has to be sudo so that we can still get some of the, uh, uh, so we can still run and, and clean up root, you know, root owned files or you name it. The problem is when you sudo Python, I can do whatever I want with Python's root. Same thing for Perl and Ruby and Lua and, and pretty much anything else we want to do. How do you exploit Perl in two words, exact bin sh? Right, let's take a look at this. So we sudo minus l. And our system administrator here, unfortunately, was eating lead paint chips for breakfast, and he has put Perl uh, into the uh, I put Perl uh, into the sudo list. Uh, we'll go ahead and sudo Perl, and ultimately it looks like nothing's happening here. 
what's really happening is Perl's waiting for uh, <coughs> Perl is waiting for a uh, basically waiting for some input, and so we'll say exec uh, in dash semicolon, and we hit that, and it still looks like nothing's happened. But the reality here is now Perl is waiting for an end of file. It's waiting for some number of commands plus an EOF. And we're sending the OS to press Control D, and I agree. All right, so uh, if you have Perl, uh, so that you're able to run some awesome, uh, so that you're able to go run some scripts uh, as root, even though you're not root, understand that you're giving away root, right? It, it's not. And the problem is here, a lot of folks when they see this sudo stuff, again, the limited sudo permissions, uh, what they're thinking is, from a system admin perspective, I'm not giving away root. And when they put their prep model together, they say, I'm not giving away super user access. It's limited to super user access, limited to only these few commands. And as we're seeing here, that's not the reality. There are a tremendous number of commands that are like giant landmines on Linux, right? Meaning the command is there, uh, but when you step on it, you lose your foot, right? And if, if you're lucky, that's all you lose, right? Okay, so uh, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at Python. Ah, Ruby. Let's do Ruby. Uh, Ruby is almost as easy. Uh, with Ruby, we're going to exec uh, bin uh, bash. Uh, don't put a semicolon here, because Ruby doesn't like semicolons. And, and again, we're root, right? So don't do that either, right? Gotcha. Uh, so, so don't do that either. Uh, Python, as it turns out, is only moderately more difficult, right? So you're going to have to know more than like that to, to do Python. Uh, we'll try Python here, see if I can remember this. Let's see, I think it was import, uh, import OS and uh, os.system. Uh, so os.system uh, slash bin uh, slash bash. Yep, that was it. And so, uh, if you can't remember this, get out of the info setting, right? Uh, the cognitive load is much higher than this. Uh, and so, look, the reality is here, we've walked through what now? A dozen different, uh, ten different ways, some number of different ways, uh, because we're living in America, and I feel great. No, it's I feel good, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, James Brown approach is clearly just not going to happen here. I tried, I tried, just no, right? Anyway. Uh, so we've gone through a dozen different ways here, or several different ways at least to get root. Uh, there are a number of others. Uh, the bottom line here is these are the most common ones that we see on systems today where people have screwed up limited sudo permissions. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we'll get on and we'll see that uh, we've had cases where, uh, where we get on and a particular user doesn't have something awesome in sudo. Uh, you may be one social engineering phone call away from getting that. Right? So, so don't keep that out, or don't take that out of your uh, back pocket either. Uh, just explain that you need to be able to less this particular file. It's possible that somebody's dumb enough to let you do that. Right? Uh, I'm not saying that that's actually happened anywhere. Right? Anyway, uh, we definitely are not going to name any, any, uh, any names there. So uh, here again, you're going to have to control D twice to get out of there, but uh, again, you should be able to handle that as well. Let's see, what else do I have here? I think it's going to bring me close to the end. Yeah, I think I have Perl and Python. Ruby, yeah, did that, did that. That's it. All right, so that's all I've got. I got ten minutes for questions. Uh, Brandon, do you have do you have winners of gift cards? I do. You do. Who are the winners? Wade Adams. Wade Adams. Where's Wade? Wade. Awesome, man. Come up, grab a gift card. What was the tweet? What was the tweet? Who knows? I'm sure it was uh, awesome. It was something. It was something. There we go. It could be random pick, right? Do we have any questions, by the way, too, while he goes through and picks out the gift card winners? <laughs> Fire. Who's next? Winner number two is Melba Squires. Melba Squires. Where's Melba at? There we are. <laughs> I would know you if I saw it. I couldn't see you. There we go. Good. Who else? The last name there. Who is it? Obscure Rob. Obscure Rob. Who's Obscure Rob? That was a Twitter account, so. Oh, you're a Wrong. He was trying to remain anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, it was. You were anonymous until now, right? So, thanks. Okay, so any questions before we break for the. Uh... Okay, well, there's no questions. No joke. Oh, sorry. He was uh, sitting down. If you've been a rattlesnake, I'd be dead. <laughs> so, go ahead. Oh yeah, Auth is totally exploitable. Sorry, I had Auth in there and we just didn't want to draw it. Uh, Auth can be used to create subshell processes. It doesn't drop the, the pseudo permission. It's totally exploitable. Yeah, on almost every system. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so that was a great question. In the back? Uh, if this is the first thing you try on a pen test, how many levels, like what percentage of times do you have to elevate um, 
your TCP to like find something a little more difficult. So if this is the first, if the sudo is the first, so I walk you through everything that we do. Let me step back there. For the for the TTPs, I walk you through on the slides here everything that we do. Sudo is the first thing we go to, right? But the other stuff we do as well. We look for scripts with weak permissions. We look for cron. Unfortunately, those aren't instant gratification things. They're not cool to watch me pop a shell, right? Because oftentimes I'll, I'll do the exploit and then I'll have to fill my thumbs for a little bit. And a few hours later, I get a call back, right? And so that's, I mean, that would be cool, but you guys would be long gone by the time we got the shell and nobody would clap and I would feel bad. So uh, <laughs> we're going to go to the super minus L and that's going to that's gonna get us. Uh, I think ran about 60, 70% of the time, I think. I agree. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> ran is my right hand man when it comes to uh, knocking stuff over in weird ways. So, look, now when that doesn't work, we're going to go to uh, trivially exploitable uh, set UID programs, and that's about another 15 to some odd percent. I think we're pushing up towards 90, 95 ish, if my math is. My math may be bad, I don't know. Whatever, look. Bottom line, uh, that's our start. We go to trivial exploitable set UID programs next, and then we're off to the races. Yep. What's the one thing that can solve most of our problems? What's that? What's the one thing that can solve most of our problems? The one thing that can solve most of your problems? Uh, give her a pseudo. Seriously. No, 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 James Brown said dancing. Dancing? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, anyway, hey, so before everybody breaks, I forgot I have the clubhouse and the uh, land turtle. Uh, are we doing random pick for this stuff, or what? Who, who asked me about James Brown? Who asked me about James Brown? No joke. Seriously? Oh, well, you're, you're not local, so you're not taking the clubhouse. Here you go. So, I know, I know. But that was too good. That was too good to pass up. So I'm looking for somebody local that can use a clubhouse uh, clubhouse pass. That was the first hand I saw go up over there. You win. About the uh, Linux privilege, es Linux privilege escalation or any of that other awesome stuff, uh, come hit the booth for addition infosec. We're hiring. We're hiring. I'd love to steal some people away from CTBs and NSAs and other other great places for <laughs> new infosec. Come talk to me. We pay better than they do. <laughs> oh, 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 oh,